Good evening, thank you very much. So my name is Tom Mickelson. I'm the President and Scientific Director of the Ontario Brain Institute. I'm the only one standing between you and this fabulous program we have you this evening, so I'm going to just give you a very brief introduction to what the OBI is and why we're assembled uh, tonight. So thank you co very much for coming out on a weeknight uh, for this, but I guarantee you it's going to be well worth your while. The role of the OBI, the Ontario Brain Institute, is to make Ontario a world leader in brain research, but also to embed this avenue of commercialization and to do good industry work and, more importantly, to provide best care uh, in the province for patients dealing with neurologic disorders. We do this by creating partnerships between researchers, MDs, industry, patients and their advocates to follow, you know, do new discovery and to develop, develop new innovative products and services that improve the life of patients living with brain disorders. Now, OBI wasn't created simply as a neuroscience research institute, but to ensure that the best science makes its way into the care delivery community. We know that the cost and the burden of neurologic disease in the population is burgeoning, and efficient, effective therapies are required for both fiscally, uh, eco economically uh, efficient uh, techniques, but also more impactful clinically. The partnership that we're developing with groups such as the Alzheimer's Society, ministries of the government, and industry are essential for us collectively to achieve this kind of success. So the government then engaged the OBI and its programs as partners in several policy initiatives to improve the quality of the care delivered for those folks living in Ontario with brain disorders. But specifically related to this, th this talk this evening, OBI has been involved with the Ontario uh, uh, Dementia Strategy and the capacity planning for what's being called the grey tsunami, the aging of the population and the looming burden of the disorder of dementia that we'll hear about this evening. This capacity planning and the science to inform the best policy is primarily what we're about. I'd personally like to thank the Alzheimer's Society for London and Middlesex who are here today providing some information about their services as you've seen in the lobby. Not only do they improve the care and quality uh, of life for those living with dementia in Ontario, but the many chapters of this group are also strong partners with us at OBI in helping bring science from the bench to the backyard. The, uh, we've partnered them specifically on programs uh, including several key initiatives, including the Minds in Motion program, which uh, gets patients with dementia engaged in physical activity, as they say, medicine, uh, sorry, exercise is medicine. And we know that this, uh, in fact, can help reduce the risk of developing dementia and slow the rate of progression. We have co-funded several primary care me uh, me uh, memory clinics, which reduce the wait time from the suspicion of a memory disorder towards diagnosis and the delivery of high quality care. We've partnered on several public outreach initiatives, raising awareness of dementia across Ontario. And we are representatives of the Alzheimer's Society who sit on our patient advisory committees for our research programs to inform important research questions to the investigators. The neurodegeneration program that we sponsor is called the Ontario Neurodegenerative Disease Research Initiative, or ONDRI for short, and it's led here by Dean Mike Strong, here from London. I want to give you a high-level overview of OBI in another context. We fund and manage other research programs dealing with disorders as diverse as cerebral palsy, the autism spectrum disorders, including ADHD and others, treatment refractory epilepsy, depression, and uh, um, these dementia-related disorders. Each of these programs embeds researchers, clinical docs, patients, industry, and policymakers from government, and allow, allow us to share data and make the best decisions uh, on a data platform, a big data platform called Brain Code. So this Andre program focuses on studying dementia and diseases associated with dementia, such as Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, frontotemporal dementia, and vascular cognitive impairment. The important point to realize is that these discrete sounding diagnoses, in fact, overlap quite a lot. And the difficulty has been is to resolve uh, folks that look like one another so we can actually do more clever and more efficient clinical trials. So dementia, as I mentioned, is the greatest cause of disability in Canada's senior population. It costs already Canadians billions of dollars and a figure that's expected to grow over the next 20 years tenfold. Uh, there have been some statistics to suggest that the burden of disease uh, of dementia will cost more than heart disease and cancer combined. So disease-modifying therapies are critical, and we're laying the infrastructure to develop those as we speak. 
So this Andre group is at that leading cutting edge. Their goal is to investigate these disorders regardless of the label that they've been given and to use data to derive important information about how these diseases announce themselves and how they progress over time. This will allow more efficient, more specific clinical trials for the molecules and the pathways that drive these disorders as opposed to simply treating the, the generic uh, symptom of dementia as is currently done. So this mandate to take advantage of the data in the care delivery community to look at new diagnostic methods, a way of uh, developing the biology, not as a bench enterprise, but as a innovative clinical care exercise is what we're all about. And you're gonna hear about some of that this evening. So I'd like to introduce the speakers for this evening. First of all, Dr. Elizabeth Finger is an associate professor in the Department of Clinical Neurological Sciences here at Western. She is a neurologist at the Parkwood Institute and a scientist at Lawson. Her research focuses on advancing diagnosis and treatment for neuropsychiatric disorders including frontotemporal dementia, and she studies the, the behavioral or cognitive aspects, the neural and genetic aspects of the abnormal processes in decision-making, emotion, and social behavior. She uh, helps run the Cognitive Neurology and Alzheimer's Disease Research Center at Parkwood. Her clinic is specialized in diagnosing patients with these neurologic uh, neurodegenerative disorders, including, as I said, FTD, Alzheimer's disease, Lewy body dementia, and others. Dr. J.B. Orange will be next. He is the director of the School of Communication Sciences and Disorders at Western University and an associate scientist at the Lawson. His focus is on acquired language disorders and other cognitive and communication disorders associated in the elderly population. And his current research in, involves analyses of language, conversation, and the pragmatics in individuals at risk for neurodegenerative disorders, including Alzheimer's disease, frontotemporal dementia, and something called primary progressive aphasia, which is a variant. Other ongoing studies include communication enhancement, education, and training programs of caregivers and individuals dealing with these disorders. Dr. Mandar Jog is the director of the National Parkinson Foundation Center of Excellence at the London Health Sciences Center and director of the Movement Disorders Pro Program here in London and professor of neurology at Western. His research interests include topics such as motor control, neurophysiology, and computational modeling, and web-based teaching in the context of movement disorders. He has a number of patents and is looking at commercialization with strong collaboration with the university technology and how you actually deploy IP, intellectual property, from the university environment into industry. And he's the founder of a couple of uh, corporations, including Medtrode. Our moderator tonight, which will lead a, a, a facilitated discussion at the end, is Meredith Levine. She's a professor of uh, journalism at Western and a multimedia journalist who specializes in chronic health issues and vulnerable populations. Her research focuses primarily on narratives of chronic illness, journalism ethics, and erasing boundaries between journalism and advertising content. So at the end of the presentations, Meredith will join and, and facilitate the discussion. So first of all, I'd like to uh, welcome Dr. Finger to kick off uh, the evening's events. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mickelson, and thank you to the OBI and Andre for the opportunity to speak to you on what is uh, one of my uh, favorite topics. Um, so frontotemporal dementia, empathy, and oxytocin. Uh, these are my disclosures. So I'd like to start by introducing you to frontotemporal dementia. Frontotemporal dementia is the second most common cause of early onset dementia. That is something that is a progressive dementia before the age of 65. Frontotemporal dementia typically affects people in the prime of life, in their 50s and 60s, when they're still working, perhaps raising children. And thus, it exacts enormous fi uh, emotional, financial, and psychological tolls on patients, caregivers, and family around them. As the symptoms of frontotemporal dementia may differ from those of Alzheimer's, I wanted to um, introduce some of them to you. Previously normal, high-functioning individuals who develop FTD become disinhibited. They start to say things that may not be appropriate in front of others or to strangers, things they never would have said before. They typically lose interest or lose motivation to participate in their hobbies or to socialize with friends that they used to enjoy. One of the most devastating symptoms of FTD for caregivers and families is the early loss of empathy and sympathy that most of these patients undergo, and which will be the focus of most of my talk tonight. In addition, some patients develop early perseverative 
or compulsive type behaviors like you might see in obsessive compulsive disorder. Some start to binge eat or eat unusual things, sweets only, or sometimes even inedible objects. Often what's going on is missed for a while because the cognitive testing that might be done by the physician and the family doctor's office, even in the memory clinic, and even in our specialized cognitive clinics, may not pick up abnormalities towards the beginning. And in particular, their memory is often very good. Patients with frontotemporal dementia tend to have atrophy, which is our word for shrinkage, in the frontal and or temporal lobes of the brain. Although for some patients, this shrinkage is not visible until many years into the illness causing a diagnostic challenge. This is an MRI scan from a patient with rather advanced frontotemporal dementia and very severe atrophy. And for those of you that aren't used to looking at these, I'll just orient you that this is the back of the brain, this is the front, these are the eyeballs. Our brain should be nice and full. This white and gray here is normal in size and contour, but these are the most anterior parts of the temporal poles. They should all be white and gray as well. And instead, we see the void of black, showing that this temporal lobe is now a string-like structure on both sides. So to focus on empathy tonight, I wanted to provide you with some examples of how empathy deficits manifest in frontotemporal dementia. These are examples from patients that we've seen in the clinic at St. Joseph's Hospital and at Parkwood Institute over the past 10 years. The first was a 58-year-old woman diagnosed with FTD whose husband was called suddenly in for cataract surgery and he was pleased he'd been waiting, but she refused to postpone their road trip to Florida for just five days for him to get the surgery. Instead, took off in the car, drove without him, leaving him to find his own way to get to Florida, even though they had no reason to be there right away. Another was a 63-year-old man also diagnosed with FTD whose wife had cancer and was undergoing chemotherapy. She would come home nauseous, clearly fe feeling ill and fatigued, and he would pester her repeatedly each afternoon to go out on unnecessary, trivial errands. The third was a 67-year-old man, a grandfather, who used to love playing with his grandchildren and was very good at it. But over the course of the disease, he began to pester his grandchildren when he was playing with them to the point where they would cry, and then he would start to cry with them. These are all drastic examples, but they're not uncommon examples of the kind of empathy deficits and resultant behaviors that we see over the course of FTD. In addition to the dramatic examples, nearly universally, uh, we see daily failures by patients to ask about the loved ones or the family around them. You can see from these examples that empathy deficits can be devastating to relationships. Certainly many of our patients and families come after they've already separated or divorced from a spouse or alienated their children even or friends and other family members because of the way that empathy deficits destroy relationships. So as these examples highlight, empathy is critical for normal social interactions. So I'd like to now switch to ask what is empathy and why is it impaired or what leads it to disappear in front of temporal dementia? I think we all have some idea in our daily lives of what empathy is. A definition that's commonly used in neuroscience and psychology is that empathy is the experience of an affective or emotional response that's more appropriate to someone else's circumstance than your own. Empathy is thought to be a critical way that pro-social or compassionate behaviors are triggered. The process of empathy allows us to step into another's shoes, as the proverbial saying goes. Humans typically do this routinely and automatically, and the field of cognitive neuroscience has partially uncovered how this happens in our brains. One key, it appears, is that we are primed to automatically imitate or automatically mimic others. And now a classic example of this is the way that we imitate yawning. Yawning is now recognized as being something that's contagious across humans. Many adults will yawn when we see someone else yawn. 
Even when people are taken into an observed laboratory setting, about 40 to 50% of university students will yawn if they see someone else yawn or even a video of someone yawning. Children begin to have this contagious mimicry of yawning beginning around age four. And as you can see here, it even occurs across species. This is a science take from the New York Times showing the experimenter yawning um, and the primate uh, uh, imitating them. This kind of automatic mimicry or automatic imitation is critical in particular for learning, but it appears that it also has a key role for empathy. The automatic imitation or automatic mimicry is also present when we view emotional facial expressions. If we see a sad face, a, a fearful face, um, or a happy face, our own faces make micro movements as though we were making that expression ourselves. This uh, has been looked at now in cognitive neuroscience and we look to see why this is happening. It appears that in our brains, the same areas activate in our own brains when we look at somebody who's sad as if we were sad ourselves. So really we do our brains put us in other people's shoes, both in their internal and external states. Unfortunately, patients with frontotemporal dementia start to have trouble with this automatic exchange of information, facial expression, communication, and recognition. As you can see here, our patients in green compared to controls in purple, show reduced accuracy when recognizing different emotional facial expressions, particularly negative expressions like anger, disgust, fear, or sadness. Our group was then interested in looking at why is this happening? We hypothesized that this deficit in facial expression recognition is probably an important part of their empathy deficit. To do that, a few years ago, we conducted one of our first tests of this hypothesis using a functional MRI scanner at Robarts Research Institute. It allows us to take a picture of brain activation while somebody's thinking. So the patient enters the scanner, and while they're in, they look at the pictures here on a computer monitor, in this case of different facial expressions. When normal, healthy adults do this, it's been replicated many times the world over, uh, certain regions of the frontal lobes and temporal lobes of the brain are activated, as, whoops, as you can see here by the red activation. This pattern differs a little bit across emotions, so the regions activated for anger would look a little different than disgust or sadness, but they're rec replicable and quite consistent across healthy adults. When we look at this, though, in patients with frontotemporal dementia, we see part of the problem. So when our patients with FTD looked at those emotional faces in the scanner, when we compared them to healthy controls, they showed reduced activation in key regions of the frontal and temporal lobes that we know are important for these expressions. So in blue and green are the regions where FTD patients did not activate their brains as much as the healthy controls for disgust, anger, and happy shown here. Interestingly, and it wasn't completely what we predicted, it wasn't as though the FTD patients had less activation everywhere. In the back of the brain, here in yellow and red, in regions of the parietal cortex, we actually saw increased activity in patients relative to controls. Now, these regions make up a part of what's a dorsal attentional network in the brain. And so we think this is a, a way the brain is automatically trying to compensate to process the incoming stimulus or information in the setting of having reduced inputs from the frontal and temporal lobes. With these findings and our next question in trying to pursue uh, empathy deficits and to remedy them in patients with FTD was to think about ways that we could increase brain activation in these regions when patients are engaged in this kind of social interaction. Unfortunately, right now, as for many of the neurodegenerative diseases, there are no treatments that can actually cure the disease nor slow it. Um, and across any neurologic or psychiatric disorder right now, there aren't any treatments that specifically can improve deficits in empathy. 
With that gap in treatment, we became interested in the growing literature around the hormone and neuropeptide oxytocin. And I'll just say right off the bat, although the spelling is similar, it's completely unrelated to OxyContin. Uh, this is not a narcotic. Um, that may delight some of you and make some of you less interested, but um, oxytocin is a, a thought to be, or previously known as a maternal hormone. It's conserved across phylogeny, that and the closely related hormone vasopressin, so clearly important for many different species. When oxytocin is given in a variety of ways to various species, including humans, it increases a group of pro-social behaviors that includes uh, grooming behaviors, nest building, uh, pair bonding. It decreases anxiety in some models, although interestingly, it may increase uh, some specific forms of aggression. So if oxytocin is given to mother rats who are nursing their pups, if an intruder rat enters the area, the mother will exhibit increased aggression towards that intruder in defense of the young ones if her oxytocin levels are higher. Cognitive neuroscientists are still figuring out exactly how oxytocin changes behavior in these ways, but there are a few very interesting studies that are starting to shed some light on this. This study, uh, done by a different group back in 2015, looked at a well-known behavior in rats uh, in terms of um, retrieving pups. So a mother rat, that's called a dam, if they hear a cry from a pup that's not with the group, will consistently go over and retrieve that pup and bring it back to the group for safety. But a rat that is not a mother, here called the naive virgins, will not reliably go to retrieve the pup if they hear a pup cry. So the group took advantage of this and increased the oxytocin levels in a couple of different ways in the naive rats and found that they doubled their retrieval of the pups when oxytocin levels were higher. When they tried to see what was happening in the brain to make this uh, change, they found that in the auditory cortex, which is the part of the brain that first processes incoming sound information, that oxytocin actually promoted increased activity and increased excitation of those neurons. So it seemingly turns the volume up in our brains on signals that are socially important. Oxytocin is produced in a structure in the middle of all of our brains called the hypothalamus. It's produced in both men and women. And from there, there are neuronal projections that send oxytocin to regions of the frontal and temporal lobes, specifically many regions that are involved in reward processing and different social behaviors. With that background literature then, we conducted two pilot studies of intranasal oxytocin in patients with frontotemporal dementia to see if it might improve their pro-social or their compassionate behaviors and improve some of their deficits in empathy. This is data from one of those studies. Patients here received a week of oxytocin sprays twice a day or were randomized to placebo, which was just a saline saltwater spray. What we found was that in comparison to the patients that were randomized to receive placebo, which is this group here in green, about half of the patients, 50% of the patients randomized to receive oxytocin over the week, showed an improvement in empathic behaviors or in empathy-related behaviors as rated by their caregivers. With this finding, we became interested in looking back again to say, what is oxytocin doing in the brain of humans, and in particular the patients with FTD, that might result in this change in behavior? This is an ongoing study right now that's nearly finished, but I'll, I'll share some of the basics with you. So we're using the fMRI scanner again. This time patients are seeing videos of facial expressions. It's a little more naturalistic than a static image. They watch some of these, and on other trials, we actually ask them to imitate the facial expression. They do two scans doing this task, two weeks apart, and during one scan, just before they've gotten oxytocin, and on the other visit, they get placebo, so that we can compare specifically the effects of oxytocin. This are preliminary data, so we haven't done the final analysis, but I wanted to give you a flavor of what we saw towards the beginning. So here we have, in red, the regions of the brain that were more active during the oxytocin session than during the placebo session. So we are quite interested to see that for several of the expressions, 
we see increased activity in regions of the frontal or temporal lobes that are known to be normally active when people view these expressions, and that within the same patients, we're seeing oxytocin increase brain activation in these regions. In contrast, we see reduced activity in fear and anger. And at first, we weren't quite sure what to make of this result, but the literature since has suggested that even in healthy adults, if you give oxytocin, you might induce a positivity bias. That is, there's less response or less uh, activation to threatening stimuli, which fearful and angry faces are thought to represent. With these results, um, we're pleased to uh, say that we were awarded grants from CIHR and the Weston Foundation now to really expand this work to a full-scale clinical trial to see if oxytocin might be effective over a longer term for these symptoms of empathy deficits in patients with frontotemporal dementia. So this study will be a six-week clinical trial of treatment and a six-week trial of placebo, so every patient will get both of those windows of treatment so that we can compare in each individual whether it seems to be helpful. The study is going to take place across approximately 12 centers in the U.S. and Canada. And again, our primary outcomes of interest are change in empathic behaviors as rated by caregivers. So in conclusion, just like to thank our numerous collaborators uh, here at Western, my very hardworking team, and our collaborators uh, nationally and internationally as well. And um, of course, our funding agencies and and most of all, the patients and families that volunteer and work with us. Thanks very much. <laughs>